We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Today we are continuing on in our series, Origins, and we're going to be talking about the origin of sin. The or, it's, it's referred to as the fall. It's, it's what we oftentimes even refer to as the human condition. But before we dive into God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have given us not just hope, but a living hope in Jesus. And there may be people here who are just trying to figure out who you are. So I ask, Father, that you would reveal that to them. Father, I ask that you would help me to speak your word clearly and boldly and unashamedly. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace, and we invite you to work in our lives here today. And everybody said, amen. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So as we talk about this subject of sin, I just want to make sure that I'm in the right room. I, uh, have any, y'all have sinned at some point or another, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, we, we read in the scriptures, it says, for all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and guess what? That includes me, that includes you. And, and so as I was putting together this message, I thought, you know, I've got a long list of sins. It's longer than my arm. It, it goes on and on and on. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, there's one particular sin that I committed many, many years ago and had to confess to God, had to, had to you know, um, just give it over to him. And I, I thought I'd share that with you because, you know, when we're in a room like this, it can oftentimes feel like, well, you know, everybody around me has it together except for me. And I want you to know, listen, we all are broken. We all have fallen short. And as I said, that includes me. So for, for, for as I'm talking about this, understand I'm in good company. For me, I think back to around eighth or ninth grade. I was a paper boy at that point. And I was on my paper route going around the neighborhood. And as I went around the neighborhood, I came to a house. I came to one of my customer's homes. And I saw that there was a, a gift on the front porch. Didn't have my name on it. But I said, for me? And so I took that gift, and I picked it up, and I put it in my newspaper satchel, and I walked away. I opened it up, I rewrapped it, and I gave it to my mom. Sorry, mom. In the midst of this, a few months went by, and my neighbor eventually came to my house and said, hey, there was a package on my front porch. Did you steal it? Did you, did you or actually, she didn't put it that way. She said, hey, did you ever see it? I said, the only thing that I could. No, I never saw that. I have confessed that to the Lord. understand that it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. In fact, when you go to the very first chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Pastor Matt talked about this last week. It said of all creation that everything was good and very good. I like how Genesis 2.25 puts it. It says, now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Now some of you, yeah, I heard you guys were like, oh, what? 
in the midst of this, a lot of times it's like, oh, they were naked. Hear the second part, because it's so much more important. It points to why that's not a problem at that moment. It says, and they felt no shame. In Middle Eastern culture, the idea of being naked wasn't just shameful. If, if, you were, if, if somebody saw your nakedness, not only were you going to be like, ah, but in addition to that, they were going to be like, ah, because, and that's the noise that they make, um, but, but with an accent. But, but within it, understand that it's your nakedness is not just shameful towards you, it's actually shameful towards the other person. And that's not just in, that's not just Middle Eastern culture, is it? Because if you suddenly see some dude, you know, naked going through the drive through at McDonald's, like you're like, whoa, hold on. And you look away and you're like, ah, I just can't get that out of my head. Ah. We all have these moments where uh, sin enters the world. But at this moment, they were naked and they felt no shame. There was no shame in the relationship. There was no bickering. There was, there was nothing like that. Everything is good and very good. And then we come into that point of, well, what is sin? I mean, that's like talking to a child. What's, what's sin? Like, you know it when you see it. But let's define it a little bit more. We're going to be looking at nine lessons from the fall. This is what this moment is called. Called. This is called the fall. It, and the first lesson that we see is sin at its core is disobedience. It is to miss the mark. If you're going for a target, you're sometimes we are way off, aren't we? It's to miss the mark. It's disobedience. And we're going to see that here in just a moment. And as we pick up in Genesis 3, and if you don't have a Bible, feel free to grab the Bible right in front of the chair in front of you. Um, that's our gift to you. But as we go into Genesis 3, it says, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? See, when we come here, understand the enemy will cause you to question God's word, character, and or plan. And when we go to the book of Revelation, at the very end of the Bible, it says in Revelation 12, 9, if we ever had a question of who is the serpent, it says this great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all the angel. So clearly there's something more going on here. Jesus says in John 8, 44, he says, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was all, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. We continue on in the story, and we see in verse 2 and 3, it says, of, Eve says this, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. And then the serpent replies, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, what you have to know about this story, if you've not heard this before, God makes everything good and very good, and he speaks to Adam, and he says, you can eat of anything in the garden except there's two trees in the very middle. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, that one, the first one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat of anything in here, but leave that one alone because in that day you will surely die. Now, clearly Adam has shared something with Eve. And in the midst of this, she's having this conversation, but she does something as she's talking with the serpent. 
as she's talking with Satan, she adds to what God had said. Well, we can't, we can't even touch it. God didn't say that you couldn't touch it. He said you can't eat it. And in that day, you will surely die. And so the second lesson that we see from the fall is misquoting God leads to sin, pain, and death. We're going to see this a little bit more as as the story goes on. But there are ways, there are ways that we can deal with the enemy. We see Jesus, he is led out into the wilderness in Matthew 4 by the Holy Spirit. And after 40 days of not eating. He's pretty hungry, as you can imagine. And it says in Matthew 4, 3, the tempter, Satan, came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. God. And what we learn here is that the next lesson from the fall is quoting God leads to truth, life, and the way of God. So if misquoting God leads to death and destruction, quoting God leads to something greater, something good and very good. It continues on in verse 6 and says, the woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. Can you imagine just in that moment? She looked at it. She was enticed by it. Kept on looking at it. How, I wonder how much she looked at it. And, and had she looked at it before? I don't know. But she was enticed. It's kind of like when we're tempted. You know, oh, it's, it's not a big deal. It's going to mess around with that. And then it says, so she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. That's right. This whole conversation is going on and Adam is right there. I don't know if you placed him someplace else and he wandered into the conversation and he's like, hey, what are you guys doing? Oh, food, great. Let me eat some of that. No, that's not how it went. He's sitting there watching this whole thing go on. He could have said, that's not what God said. Hold on. Or just simply said, we don't need to have that conversation. Let's go someplace else. Obviously, this isn't good. There's a lot of things that he could have done, but he didn't do that. So they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. In verse 7, it says, at that moment, their eyes were opened. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. I'm sure that will work. Understand, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, it's been said. Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you wanted to pay. Everything had been good and very good, but then they... They ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They sinned against God. They had disobedience. And so this leads into our fourth lesson from the fall, and that is sin leads to shame and will cause you to hide it or flaunt it in God's face. Now, in the days of Adam and Eve, sin entered the world in that moment. And they immediately were like, yikes, we're naked. We got to fix this. They felt the shame. But oftentimes today, there's a, a saying that maybe you've heard. There are moments that you do something, you're, you know that it's wrong, and you own it. You feel the shame. But maybe you've heard it at some point or another. You can't shame me. You can't shame me. Now, there are things that we don't need to be shameful for because God doesn't even, doesn't even say that it's shameful. However, there are things that if we're going to walk with God, when we sin, we have to own it. And when people say, you can't shame me, and it's about something that God says, actually, you should feel some shame. 
then we should unashamedly repent, turn away from it. We should, we should say, God, God, I'm so sorry for doing that. We should own it and say, listen, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to have this. And this, this causes us, if we don't own it, to just simply throw it in God's face. We pick up in verse 8, and it says, When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. Can you imagine that? Like God just shows up in the garden. Like, like God, he's walking, and, and as he's coming into the garden, like he's been there other times. He's kind of walking nonchalantly like, hey, where's Adam and Eve? Let's hang out, blah, 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 blah. Now, mind you, God knew what had already happened. And we'll talk about a little bit more of that in a minute. But as he's walking in the garden, how does Adam and Eve respond? It says, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. They decided to run from God. They decided to run from God. In the midst of this, in verse 9, it says, then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? I want to ask you this morning, where are you? Where are you right now in your relationship with God? Where are you? Are you hiding? Or are you stepping out? Unlike Adam and Eve and going, God, I'm so sorry. I, you know, there was this thing that you set out to do and I did it. Please forgive me. Help me. I can't help myself. I need your help. Can you imagine? I, I, I play this game in my head. Maybe you've heard this, what if? They even did this with some comic books. What if? What, what if this had happened instead of that? And I play that in, in, in my mind in this. I, I, you know, I, I think like even like, what if Judas hadn't hung himself? Could he have possibly been the apostle that Paul became? Could he have been like that? I don't know. Because he ended the story before the story should have been finished. And in this moment, we don't get to find out if Adam and Eve had simply just said, God, I did what you told me not to do. There was only one thing that you said not to do. I just, I, I, I'm sorry, it was my fault. And I would have loved to hear that from Eve and then Adam go, no, 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 it's not her fault. I should have been looking out for her. I, I heard her misquote you. She was my responsibility. She was, she was a gift. I wasn't enough on my own, even with you, God. But that's not the story that happens. We need to understand that fifth lesson, that hiding sin leads to hiding from God. And when we hide from God, we're not open to what God might say. We're not open to owning our own sin. And so we see what happens next in verse 12. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it because that's going to go over really well in that relationship, isn't it? How does that work out in your home life? It wasn't my fault. It was your mom's fault. What about what? What? I'm sure that Eve will do much better than Adam though, right? And it says, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's the accountability here? Where's the ownership? See, this is where we get to the sixth lesson. And that is that shifting blame is just as simple as the first act of sin. All they're doing is playing the blame game. You, you guys have played that before, right? Now, I'm sure that you've never done that in, in, in your marriage and your relationship. But certainly when you were kids, you were with your friends and, or you were with your, your brother or your sister. And it wasn't me, it was them. At some point or another, we've all played the blame game, haven't we? We've all played that. And the whole idea of... of uh, uh, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and saying, where are you? It's the equivalent of when you were growing up, and maybe you were like me. I remember as a, as a young boy, we had, this, uh, we had this beautiful, amazing porcelain 
cookie jar. <laughs> and when that thing was full, oh, my heart was full. But I wanted my belly to be full too. And so I would creep into the other room. And as only porcelain can do it justice, I lifted the lid, crank, 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 you know, you can't do it very quietly. No matter how hard, I was like, okay, if I push on it, the pressure points, this was like an Indiana Jones and the temple, you know, thing where you're just kind of pushing it over. And you would go to move it, and you might even get a cookie there, but you got to go back for more. And you get it, you put it in your mouth, and you hear from the other room, from your mom, are you in the cookie, are you in the cookie jar? No, it's, it's kind of muffled by the cookie in your mouth. Now, do you, think, do you think that my mom, do you think that your parents didn't know what you were doing? No. They're like that fisherman with, with the hook, just setting it out there and just waiting until they can reel you in. We're trying to find out where are people? Where are we in our relationship? How are you going to handle this? Now, I don't remember ever going to my parents and saying, I'm so sorry, I, I, I got in the cookie jar, I couldn't help myself. That it never happened. There was like an alternate universe going on in my head. And unfortunately, we've learned from our great, 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 great grandparents Adam and Eve, not only the blame game, but also deny, 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 right? Deny, deny, deny. But we play that blame game and we play it far too often. And then we see what the ramifications come from this sin because it says in verse 14, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly groveling in the dust as long as you live. But wait, there's more. Because God then says in verse 15, and I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. These are the words that we read from the New Testament church as prophecy, understanding that there is a shadow of one who is going to come. And so we get our seventh lesson from the fall, and that is God has a plan of redemption from the beginning. Let that sink in. Now, I can imagine living forever. It's a little difficult. I can imagine forward. But I can't imagine going backwards and having a time when there wasn't a beginning. But God has no beginning and He has no end. There's nothing that God can suddenly today, he, he, he doesn't say, wow, I didn't know that. Like there's nothing that you are going to do in your life that he's going to be surprised by at all. And so from the foundations of the world, even before that, for all eternities past, there's never been a time that God didn't know he was going to create humanity and that this moment was going to happen. There was never a moment when he didn't have the plan for Jesus, the Son of God, to be sent into the world, that God would become an incarnate. This is the mystery of the Trinity. Fully God, fully man, that Jesus would literally, that God would walk amongst us knowing that we're going to kill Him, that we're going to crucify Him, that we're going to nail Him to a cross. There was never a moment that He didn't know that. And guess what? That was plan A, and there was no plan B. There was no plan B whatsoever. But in the midst of this, God has a plan of redemption from the beginning. And then we read in Genesis 3.16, it says, Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And I have one word to say to that. Epidural. <laughs> Get me an epidural. I've got three kids. I remember how frightening that, I felt horrible for my wife going through the birth pains and everything else. And they're like, oh yeah, epidural. But let me tell you, on the second kid, they said, oh honey, just, just calm down. You're going to be here a long time. And she's like, oh, 
Bobby. And sure enough, Gabby came so fast, she was bruised on the face, there was no epidural. And let me tell you, as dad, I sat there. It's okay, babe. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I was freaking out. I was. I was that was like two to three minutes of the scariest time in my entire life. And I know in this moment, ladies, you're like, oh, get me started. Yeah, I know. It was, it was frightening. I can't begin to imagine. I'm sorry I've had a kidney stone. I don't think it can, can compare. And in this moment, that, now this isn't all in the scripture, but I can imagine that moment where Eve is talking with God and she's like, wait a minute, baby, it's going to come out where? You got to be kidding me. And then in the midst of this, we've already seen the blame game back and forth, and we've been told, hey, listen, this blame game is not going to st stop anytime soon. It's going to continue to go on and on and on. This is the result of the fall. This was not good or very good. It was never meant to be the way that we lived. If you count yourself a follower of Jesus, this is not the way that you are called to live today. In fact, if you don't count yourself a follower of Jesus, this is not the way that we are called to live today. God has a better plan in Jesus. He certainly does. But it's important to understand that, and this is our eighth lesson from the fall, is even in judgment, God offers hope. Hope? I don't know about you guys, but when I first read this, I didn't see a whole lot of hope. I'm like, okay, he's only talked to Eve. And I can imagine Adam being like, oh man, what's coming? What's coming? But in the midst of it, there is hope. Remember, Eve misquoted God. Well, if we touch it or we eat it, we are going to die. And God did say, surely in that day, you will die. And it could have been one of those things of she touches it, she falls to the ground, but she doesn't. She's enticed, she's looking at it, and she grabs that fruit. And as she grabs it and she eats it, it doesn't fall from her hand. Instead, it's handed to Adam. And then he eats it. And they're filled with shame. You would have thought in that moment that they would have just died according to what they said. But instead, what we find here, she's going to be a mom. They're going to have kids. Even though death has entered the world, life is still going to spring forward. God is not finished. God is saying, yes, it's going to be hard, but there's still going to be life. And she has Cain. She has Abel. She has Seth. And it doesn't record all of them, but guess what she had? They had other sons and daughters. They lived for like over 900 years. Over the course of that, I'm sure that there were a lot of Irish twins along the way. I don't know. But there were a lot of kids to the place where you had cousins and cousins and cousins of cousins and all that stuff. So it wasn't like they were necessarily, you know, when it came to Cain being sent out, it wasn't a matter of he had to marry his sister. It may have been a distant cousin. And if you're still thinking about that, realize... We're all related. Technically, if you're married, you're married to a very distant cousin. That's kind of weird, isn't it? But in any case, in any case, in the midst of this, then he turns and it says, and to the man, God said, he said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Man, isn't that true? It will grow thorns and thistles for you. Though you eat of its grains, by the sweat of your brow, will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Adam actually means dirt, and so I think of Adam as a dirt bag, I'll be honest. Guys, the next time that you have some, some young man come in to go out with your daughter, just remember, he's a dirt bag, okay? 
But in the midst of this, it's important to understand that we still live with the ramifications of the fall. There is a ripple effect, and that's our ninth lesson from the fall. Our sins have a ripple effect. Back, way, 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 way back, Adam and Eve sinned, and death entered a good and very good world. And now, that sin has just continued to multiply over and over and over again. And I can say with 100% accuracy, at some point or another, save Jesus coming back in our lifetime, we're all going to die at some point or another. Like that's, you know, death and taxes, that's how that goes. You die and then they tax everything or before. But in any case, sins have ripple effects. And when we read Romans 3.23, it says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, the glory of God. We all fall short. But our sins have a ripple effect. I shared at the beginning my own sin. And I could share many, many stories. And, and I want to encourage you, when you share your stories, don't try to one-up each other. Guess what? We all fall short of the glory of God. We not, should not be proud of these things. But there is a ripple effect from Adam and Eve, but even also from our sins. There's a ripple effect in your life, and you have given a ripple effect in other people's lives. I shared my sin early on. I went. I took a gift that was not my own. I lied about it. And some years went by. And I remember I was together with my church just like this, just like this morning, worshiping. And our worship leader, Lori, she's fan, she was fantastic this many, many years ago. And Lori and I were talking, and I came to find out that Lori lived in my parents' neighborhood. I was like, that's awesome. Where do you live? And she gave me the directions, and I went, I know that house. How long have you lived there? Oh, we've been there for well over a decade. We've been there for years. You can imagine how I felt in that moment, the blood coming away from my face a little, and I went, Did you used to give piano lessons? Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, Lori, I'm so sorry. I have have to ask for your forgiveness. Do you remember a day when you came to your paper boy and you said that, hey, have you seen a gift on my front porch? And he said, no. Well, yeah, I I do remember that. Lori, I I was your paper boy. I took that package. I did it. I'm so sorry. Will you please forgive me for taking that? She said, yes, I definitely forgive you. I definitely forgive you. You don't know the end of that story, do you? What story? Well, it seems, she said, that she had a student. We lived in East Lansing, Michigan, um, home of the Spartans, Michigan State University. And there was a particular student would come to East Lansing to go to school from Japan. And this Japanese student was learning how to play the piano from Lori. And Lori's birthday was coming up, and so she got a gift. She wrapped it all nice and put it on the front porch. Surprise gift. She wasn't surprised. She didn't even know anything about it because I had been there. And she didn't hear anything from her teacher, from her instructor, from her mentor for weeks and then months. And time went by and there's an honor-shame culture thing going on here where finally this student goes to Lori and says, why didn't you ever acknowledge my gift? Why didn't you ever acknowledge that I had given you a gift? And Lori had to say, you know, what gift? I put one on your front porch for you months ago, and you've never acknowledged it, and it hurts, and I'm upset. Lori had to say, I don't know anything about this. So because of my sin, there was a ripple effect where there was this breakdown of a relationship going on between this student and Lori. 
They didn't know. But there was a breakdown. For months, it went on with the student until it could be reconciled there. Sinfulness and being bent towards sin doesn't have to be the final word in the story. Whether somebody has sinned against you and you felt the ripple effect or you've sinned against somebody else and you have created a ripple effect. When we come to our what now God moment this morning, I'll make it really simple. You're either trusting in your plan or you're trusting in God's plan. Or another way that you can put this, you're either alone in your sins or you're trusting God's plan. God knew that sin came into the world. He had a plan for his son to come. He's left the gift at the doorway to your heart. But he's never letting anybody steal it. It's always there and it's always available. The question is, are you willing to open the door and receive the gift that he's given in Jesus? Are you willing to take the sins of those around you to the cross as well? And this morning, listen, If you've never heard this message, I'm going to pray in just a moment. And it's just simply, it's a simple prayer. It's it's not about the words, it's about the heart. But it's basically saying, God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I need your help. I need forgiveness. And I need help for giving others as well. If this morning you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, now's the time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're a perfect God. You declare the end from the beginning and we're sinners. I'm a sinner. Please forgive us. Please forgive me for my sins. I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sins, for our sins. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and I now choose as a broken sinner to accept this free gift, this free offer. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me and help me to live my life in and through you from now on. Please strengthen me in this. I ask in Jesus' name. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.